Hi, and welcome to Dr. V's Chemistry Webcast. In this webcast, I'm going to be discussing the modern model of the atom. In this webcast, I'd like to start by discussing some of the ideas that led to this quantum model of the atom, the modern model of the atom, and the features of this modern model of the atom and how it's different from the Bohr model of the atom. And finally, I'd like to talk about orbitals and sublevels. Now, we spent a lot of time talking about the Bohr model of the atom, but let's do a quick recap. The Bohr model had electrons moving in fixed circular orbits around the nucleus. Only certain distances from the nucleus were allowed, and these certain distances or orbits had particular energies that were allowed. Other distances and other energies can happen. It's really good at explaining emission spectra for one electron atoms, but we also know from classical physics that electrons can't be traveling in fixed circular orbits. They would be emitting electromagnetic radiation and collapsing into the nucleus. And that's not what we see. We do know that atoms are stable. So how do we fix this? Well, we need an entirely new model of the atom. And that's what, of course, we're here to talk about. The modern model of the atom is a completely different idea about how electrons are organized in atoms. It's a mathematical and statistical description of the electrons. It's sometimes referred to as the electron cloud model or the quantum mechanical model of the atom. No fixed circular orbits. Let's talk about some of the ideas that helped us get here. The French physicist Louis de Broglie discovered that electrons have wave-like properties. So we know that electrons are particles, and yet they have these wave properties. They can be diffracted. We've got an image here of electron diffraction patterns. And that tells us that matter has a wave-particle duality. Anything that has mass and velocity does have a wavelength. In fact, we can calculate it. It's the de Broglie wavelength, lambda equals h over mv. We're not going to do anything with it in my first year course, or in my AP course for that matter. If you're on the order of a size of, say, a baseball being thrown across the baseball diamond, the wavelength of that baseball is so much smaller than the dimensions of the baseball that it really doesn't matter. But when you're down on the order of atoms and electrons, the wavelengths of the moving electrons are comparable or larger than the dimensions of an individual electron. So it really matters when you're down on that level. Werner Heisenberg was a German physicist who had a lot of important contributions to the development of the modern model of the atom. One of these really important ideas was the Heisenberg uncertainty principle. He stated that we can't know the location and the momentum of an electron simultaneously. If we know where an electron is, we don't know how fast it's going. Remember, momentum is mass times velocity. If we know how fast an electron is going so that we can calculate its momentum, we don't know where it is. We know one or the other. We can't know them both with any kind of precision. In fact, Heisenberg's contributions were so important that he was awarded the Nobel Prize in Physics in 1932 for basically creating quantum mechanics. Now, if you were a physics student in the early part of the 20th century, you spent a lot of time studying waves. So we have this idea of orbits from the Bohr model, electrons traveling in fixed circular paths. But then de Broglie comes along and says, no, electrons have wave properties. It's a reasonable jump to say, oh, we could have standing waves waves where the wavelength works out so that we can fit the circle with a particular circumference, a circle with a particular radius. And so we can start to think about how orbits and wave properties of electrons might start to have a relationship based on this idea of these standing waves. The scientist who really brought all of these ideas together was Erwin Schrodinger. Schrodinger realized that we can use waves to predict the locations of electrons he developed an equation, the Schrodinger equation, and solving it gave us wave functions, which allowed us to make these predictions. The math of this is very complex. It's not math that you're going to see in high school. It's not math that you're going to see as a first year college chemistry student. So we're not interested in doing the math itself. What we want to talk about is what does the math mean? And an important piece to take away from this is that solving the Schrodinger equation requires energy to be quantized. Only certain energy values are allowed in order to solve these equations. And for this work, Erwin Schrodinger won the Nobel Prize in Physics in 1933. So this brings us back to this modern model of the atom, a quantum mechanical model of the atom, very, very different from the Bohr model. Instead of having orbits fix circular paths, we're going to talk about orbitals. 
regions of space where an electron is likely to be found around a nucleus. There are actually a lot of different types of orbitals when we start solving the Schrodinger equation. We get all these different shapes. Modern model of the atom is all about math. It's a mathematical description of where we are likely to find an electron. An orbital is a probability cloud. Where are we likely to find electrons? So we can draw a sphere around this orbital and say that we have a 90% chance of finding an electron in this region of space. Probability. Notice that we have a lot more dots close to the center of this, close to the nucleus. We can talk about electron density. Where are we most likely to find an electron? Where is an electron most probable in terms of its location? Each dot represents the probability of an electron being present at that location. And the probability map here that we're showing, which is what we're calling an orbital, says we're more likely to find electrons closer to the nucleus than farther away from the nucleus. We can show this 90% probability map. 90% of the time, we're likely to find the electron in this space. We can't say where the electron is at any particular moment. What we can say is time average, here's where we're likely to find it. It might be outside of that boundary, but chances are it's inside that boundary. A common analogy for this idea of an orbital is a fan. When the fan is spinning, you can't tell one blade from the other. Is the red blade pointing up? Is the blue blade pointing up? When it's spinning, you can't tell. All you know is that it's in there and it's moving around and it's doing what it's doing. It's really kind of a difficult idea when you get right down to it. But the whole modern model of the atom is all about orbitals, probability maps. Where are we likely to find electrons? The boundaries are fuzzy. It's not a hard cutoff. It's kind of hard to say where an orbital ends. But we do tend to talk about the 90%, sometimes you hear 95% probability inside that region. It's not a clear-cut border, and so the electrons could be outside of it. You have to remember, the nucleus is very, very tiny. There's a lot of empty space in an atom. We don't know where the electron is, and we don't know how the electrons are moving inside the orbital. We just know where they're most likely to be found. Now, one of the features about the Bohr model that makes it so useful is that we had these energy levels at those fixed orbits. Well, in the modern model, we also have energy levels. The orbitals are arranged in primary energy levels. And in fact, those energy levels correspond exactly to the energy levels that the Bohr model talked about. So we can have the first energy level, the second energy level, the third energy level. Notice how the spacings get closer and closer and closer as we get farther away from the nucleus. But it's a little harder conceptually to figure out how the orbitals are arranged in these energy levels. It was so easy with our fixed circular orbits. It's really conceptually a lot harder to visualize how the orbitals are arranged in these energy levels. Now, when we talked about the Bohr model, we said one of the issues with the Bohr model is that it couldn't accurately describe or predict all the features of emission spectra for multi-electron atoms. One of the things that you notice when you look at those spectra very, very closely is that some of the lines that appear to be single lines are actually double lines. And the Bohr model just couldn't explain these at all for multi-electron atoms. Turns out there are sublevels within the levels. And these sublevels contain orbitals, and they have orbitals with different shapes. So we can start to think about sublevels, and so that gives us actually more lines in our spectra. There are four different types of common orbitals that we find in ground state atoms. There are other types of orbitals beyond the four that I'm going to discuss here, but these are the ones you need to know about. So we can talk about s orbitals, p orbitals, d orbitals, and f orbitals. So they're different shapes, and each shape is what we call a sublevel within an energy level. So the first type of orbital that you need to know about are called s orbitals. They're spherical. So this is a solution to the Schrodinger equation. We get this spherical shape. It's actually three-dimensional. That's a little hard to show on a two-dimensional screen. And you need to know that s orbitals come in sets of one. There's one s orbital in an s sublevel. And every energy level contains an s sublevel. We can have an s orbital in energy level one. We can have an s orbital in energy level two. We can have an s orbital in energy level three, and so on. Now, the energy levels are farther and farther and farther away from the nucleus. And this does relate to the orbital size. If we look at the s orbital in energy level one, which we call the 1s orbital, right? The s orbital in energy level one. So we have a 1s orbital. And then we look at the 2s orbital, the s orbital in energy level two. And then we can look at the s orbital in energy level three, the 3s orbital. It's very clear that as the 
energy level goes up, the size of the orbitals increase. So as we go from energy level one to energy level two and energy level three, the average orbital radius increases, the orbital size increases, and the energy, of course, increases as well. The next type of orbital that you need to know about are the p orbitals. Now they have this dumbbell shape. I drew this so that you could have something that you could easily draw yourself in your notes. You should definitely make sure you know the shapes of all the orbitals. It's got this classic dumbbell shape. This is a single p orbital. It's got two lobes, but this is one orbital. And notice how it goes down to nothing at the center. This is called a node. In a p orbital, there's no electron density at the nucleus. In a p orbital, you don't tend to find electrons near the nucleus. Here are some computer generated visuals of p orbitals. They have that classic dumbbell shape. And the other thing you need to know about p orbitals is that they come in sets of three. When you have a p sublevel, you have three of these dumbbell shaped orbitals. You get three or nothing. There's no in between. They're actually arranged at 90 degree angles to each other. And in fact, if you add them all up, they add up to a perfect sphere. The other thing I want to mention is that P sublevels aren't allowed until you're in energy level two. So once you're in energy level two, you can have a P sublevel with those three dumbbell shaped orbitals. If you're in energy level three, you can have a P sublevel and so on. The next type of orbital you need to know about are called D orbitals. It's got a classic clover leaf shape. This was a little hard to draw, but I think you can do it. Make sure you can draw a d orbital. Make sure this gets in your notes. So a single d orbital has four lobes. Actually, it's a little more complicated than that. Four out of the five d orbitals have that clover leaf shape. And then there's a fifth d orbital that has two lobes and then a ring called a torus around the middle. But if you know the clover leaf shape, you'll be fine. So they've got that clover leaf shape. And as you can see from the computer generated graphics, D orbitals come in sets of five. When you have a D sublevel, there are five orbitals in that sublevel, but you're not allowed to have D sublevels until you're in energy level three and higher. That's the way it works. Make sure you can draw S orbitals, P orbitals, D orbitals. You know what those shapes are, and then you know S orbitals are singletons, P orbitals come in sets of three, D orbitals come in sets of five. The last type of orbitals that we're going to talk about for ground state elements are the F orbitals. No one is going to ask you to draw F orbitals. Here are some very lovely pictures. Wow, aren't you glad you don't have to draw these? I certainly am. The other thing you need to know about F orbitals is they come in sets of seven. When you have an F sublevel, there are seven orbitals. They have all these wild shapes, right? And you have to be in energy level four or higher in order for F orbitals to be present. That you need to know about F orbitals. They come in sets of seven. And here's just a little visual summary. Make sure you can draw S, P, and D orbitals and recognize F orbitals. Spherical S orbitals, dumbbell shaped P orbitals, clover leaf shaped D orbitals, F orbitals. They just are. In case you were wondering why we chose the letters S, P, D, and F, the spectroscopists had descriptive terms for the data that they were collecting, and the first letter of those terms are what led to S, P, D, and F. So let's summarize what we've talked about. There's been a lot. The modern model of the atom. It's a mathematical and statistical description of electrons and atoms. It's all about the math. We don't do the math. We just talk about what the math tells us. Orbitals are the regions of space around nuclei where electrons are likely to be found. We don't talk about fixed circular paths when we're talking about the modern model of the atom, the quantum mechanical model of the atom. It's all about orbitals. These orbitals are arranged in energy levels, and we have sublevels too. The sublevels are actually different types of orbitals. They contain orbitals with different shapes, S, P, D, and F. Make sure you can draw them. So we've got a much more abstract and mathematical view of the atom with the quantum mechanical model, with this idea of orbitals and electron clouds and probability. We can still use them to explain our emission spectra, but quite frankly, it's easier with the Bohr model. But these are the important ideas that you need to understand as we study atomic structure. If you haven't already subscribed to my channel, subscribe today so you get all my latest videos. We'll talk another time.